Well, today we have with us Nancy Cavey. We're very fortunate because she's an attorney for 36 years specializing in getting disabled people their insurance claims approved. Thank you so much for joining us, Nancy. Please tell us, there's so many different types of law. What made you specialize in getting people who have disabilities their claims approved? My father owned an insurance brokerage business in Maryland, and after he came back from World War II and started this business, he purchased a disability insurance policy, thinking he'd never need to have that policy. Well, unfortunately, he became disabled, and I saw him struggle with that difficult decision to stop working and apply for disability benefits. So I've seen firsthand what it's like to stop working and apply for disability and all of the emotional and financial issues that go along with it. And that's why I decided I'd be a disability attorney. Well, wow, I'm really happy that you do this because I've personally have met people and some of these are professionals. I know someone who is actually a CPA who is significantly disabled, but even with very physical and obvious disabilities, he was unable to get his claim approved without intervention by a specializing attorney. So I really applaud you for choosing this area of expertise to practice in. And I just want to ask you, this is very important, there has to be, and what is the golden rule of disability that the carriers need to follow in every claim? Well, let me tell you what they actually follow. Oh, that's, that's okay. good to know. All right. Disability insurance companies are in the business of collecting premium and buying real estate. Of they, course they are. <laughs> they they want to make money. The golden rule is they take your gold and then they rule that you're not entitled to your disability benefits. That's the golden rule that disability insurance carriers apply to most disability insurance claims. But isn't that every insurance company? They want to collect your monthly premiums, but they don't like paying out for when a claim needs to be approved. How is that any different? Well, when you buy a disability insurance policy, you're buying peace of mind for your financial security, for yourself and your family. And you expect that the disability insurance uh, carrier is going to pay you the disability benefits. You think that when you fill out that application and you send it in, there's going to be a FedEx check that arrives the next day. You mean that doesn't happen? That doesn't happen. Oh, that's, that's why we're here. Uh, that's really what I think most people think. When does their money start rolling in and, hey, can that be direct account deposited to my bank account? <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, life is not that fluid and easy, is it? No, it isn't. And, you know, I see that the disability insurance carriers will prey on disability applicants because there are three general mistakes that applicants will make. Would you like to know what they are? I would love to know what they are because that's why we're here, right, to dispel... Right. Uh, myths and get things done and approved. We need to help people through their crisis. So I, I think of it as PMP. What does that mean? The first mistakes that people make involve the policy. They don't know what the, is in their policy. But one of the key terms in a disability insurance policy is something called a discretionary clause. Do you know what that is? I don't. You need to tell me. That discretionary clause says that the disability insurance company gets the right to not only decide the terms of the policy, but whether or not you're disabled. And it becomes a golden handcuff that prevents a federal judge from overturning that disability denial. It's really tough if you've got that discretionary handcuff clause in the disability insurance policy. What is the third? Well, let's talk about the second. Oh, we're still on the second. <laughs> the, second the second problem is that people just don't understand what's in their medical records and whether their doctor supports their claim. And as a result of not knowing what's in that uh, medical record, many times people will pick the wrong date to become disabled. Or they may think that the doctor supports their claim, but when the doctor is asked to fill out these forms called attending physician statement forms, the doctor says they can work. And the last time, or the worst time, you want to find out that your doctor doesn't support your claim is when that doctor is filling out attending physician statement forms for you. Why would a doctor not work with the patient they're helping? Doctors didn't go to medical school to learn how to write reports for disability insurance companies. They're interested in practicing medicine. That's one of the things I want the disability applicant to know before they apply for disability benefits. Does your doctor support your claim? And will that doctor fill out that attending physician statement form? Do you find that physicians are willing to discuss it with their client or their patient? on how to help them
facilitate a successful claim? Sometimes. Now, most doctors do have their own disability insurance policy, so they're familiar with disability insurance. But I, I think that uh, it, it's important that you ask that question because if you get an answer and the doctor says, well, no, I either don't support your claim or I won't fill out those forms, I have to tell my clients, it's time for you to find another, uh, another, another doctor. doctor. You know, you may have the best doctor in the world, but if the doctor doesn't support your claim, then you don't have a case. But why would a doctor refuse to fill out these forms? Don't they have an obligation to help their patient? Well, they do have an obligation, but no one's holding a gun to their head to say, yes, you've got to fill out these forms. So, unfortunately, there are times when doctors just won't cooperate. But you need to know that before you apply for disability benefits. Oh, that benefits. is so unconscionable why anyone would harm. To me, that's harming someone to just be able to live and pay their bills. Well, another mistake that I see uh, applicants make is, I call it, the practical problems. And can you imagine what those practical problems are? How could it be practical? What would those problems look like? Well, you have a cell phone, right? Of course, don't we all? And what do you do on your cell phone? Everything. They're smartphones. Right. And they're smart, and you play games, and you do social media, like Facebook. So one of the things I suggest is that you turn off all of your social media. And in fact, that you don't let your relatives comment about you or post photographs, because Disability insurance carriers will do an investigation of your social media posting. So I tell my clients, no, 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 no. We are going to pull the plug in. You're going to be disconnected from social media. That's an excellent tip. They've heard that so many problems can arise by divulging too much of your day-to-day -day on social media for a variety of reasons. Can you just give me one example of a claim that sticks out in your head before we have to wrap up? Sure. Um, I've had the honor of representing a female Marine Corps major who had a distinguished service. And when she retired, she became employed at a defense firm in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, she had a stroke. And when she applied for disability benefits, the insurance company said, it's all in your head. <gasps> That's horrible. It's psychiatric. It's not organic. Ultimately, we filed an appeal. We filed a lawsuit. And for the first time, Vivian, the disability insurance carrier got to meet my client. And I said to them, Marines don't cry. Mm. So you do a great benefit, not just to every American who ends up being your client, but to those who have served keeping America safe. Thank you so much, Nancy. That is extremely informative to everyone who needs this help. Thank you. So here with me today is Janelle Edward Stewart. She is an attorney with the law firm of Porzio, Bromberg & Newman out of Morristown, New Jersey. And she is part of the litigation team that just won Litigation Team of the Year Award for 2016 in the state of New Jersey. Congratulations, Janelle. That's a Thank fantastic you. achievement. Thank you. And Janelle specifically practices employment and education law and counsels clients who are generally company owners, managers, schools, and school districts on how to address disabilities and disability accommodations in the context of work and school. Janelle, I am really appreciative because I know this affects perhaps what uh, hundreds of thousands of New Jerseyans and of course people from around the area because of course a lot of New York, New Jersey and so much of this area intermingle. So this really does affect a large percentage of our viewing audience. So first of all, there's something called the ADA. Could you please explain what the ADA is and how it affects people? I sure can. Thank you, Vivian, for that lovely introduction. The ADA was established in 1990 to offer broad protections to individuals with disabilities. Um, and by broad protections, what I mean is that the ADA not only prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities, but it includes an affirmative obligation to offer reasonable accommodations to disabled individuals. Now, when you say reasonable accommodation, so we're talking naturally at work and school. So there my question lies. Who decides what is reasonable? Is there a panel somewhere? Is it the government? Who does make that 
judgment call of what is deemed to be reasonable because for example what is the percentage of small business owners in this area i believe it's something to affect around 30 to 35 percent of the population uh, is a small business owner and of course it's an average of 45 percent of the workforce employed by small business owners so this is quite substantial numbers so but unfortunately a lot of accommodations could be potentially cost prohibitive so who has the right is it the small business owner that by hiring uh, someone who might have a handicap that might not even be obvious what happens if they don't make this accommodation? And there's all kinds of accommodations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What if they have a, and I've even heard about this, a comfort animal. I mean, there's all kinds for somebody who may have a psychological challenge. And when you hire someone like that as a small business owner, this, this disability is not visible. It's not as if they're walking in with a cane or a wheelchair that's visible. So could that be something that could happen in the workplace or at school? <coughs> So there, there are a lot of questions that were built into that, and I'll try to tease them apart as I address them in, in portions. Um, but I'll start with the number. First of all, um, it, you're right. A lot of potential accommodations um, could be quite cost prohibitive for employers, and that is part of the analysis. So no, it's not going to be the case that an employee can you know, simply dictate some extraordinary you know, accommodation, and then on their own, the, the employer is obligated to fulfill that obligation. It's, it's quite a ways away from that. But I'll start with, first of all, who needs to comply with this. It's not every single small business owner. Um, as of 1994, the ADA really applies to employers of 15 or more employees. Ah, I see. Um, so okay. starting there, what should happen is that the employee is the one who really is obligated more or less to place the employer on notice of the fact that they are an individual with a disability that needs an accommodation. And then from that point, there needs to be sort of a reasonable discussion and a collaboration to figure out what kind of an accommodation is most appropriate for the employee. So really, the employee and the employer together figure out what the accommodation ought to be. I see. So going into <coughs> what type of disabilities can occur. So obviously, there's many type of obvious disabilities. For example, mm -hmm. if you have a child um, who's autistic, that may become obvious, or Down syndrome, or in a wheelchair for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, but would someone who has a learning disability fall into the same guidelines? Perhaps they have an IEP at school? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, the sort of example that you're talking about triggers a number of different federal and uh, state statutes. Oh. When you're talking about a disability as far as the ADA, the ADA uh, protects individuals who are disabled, and by disabled it means that they have a physical or a mental impairment, so a specific learning disability, something like that would qualify as a mental disability, but it needs to be one that substantially inhibits a major life activity. And so major life activities can be things like walking, talking, hearing, seeing, as long as there's one or more of those that are substantially impaired, they can be regarded as a disabled individual under the ADA. Um, in terms of students within an education context, there are other laws that come into play, such as the IDEA, that's the Individuals with Disabilities Act, and you referenced a moment ago IEPs. Correct. Those are individual education programs that are designed to help students with their behavioral or mental or learning disabilities. So it's a, it's a collection of items that are discussed amongst a group of experts within the school who together with the parents sort of figure out how do we address the student's learning needs. So let me go into now the workplace environment. Mm -hmm. I actually have a friend who has a child who's autistic. Okay. And unfortunately, his wife is not a driver. So he then has to take the time off of work to take his son to appointments, whether mm -hmm. they be doctor appointments, they're looking into a specialized school. Now, he happens to own his own company. Thank goodness this isn't something he has to report to a boss about. But let's face it, not everyone's going to be self-employed with this issue. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cases where what work is given to someone could maybe be up to the employer's discretion, their immediate supervisor. Is there a case where if someone feels that they've been discriminated against because of their home obligations? So let's say my friend was employed at a traditional company, not mm -hmm. self-employed. Okay. And he had project work that he had to take care of. 
Perhaps his supervisor deemed that because of having the obligations of taking his son to doctor's appointments, he shouldn't be given a more prestigious project mm -hmm. to work on. Mm -hmm. And is that possible that that is a discrimination at the workplace because of his child's impediment and his home circumstances? Well, uh, as I indicated before, the ADA does protect individuals with disabilities themselves. And in this particular scenario, what you're suggesting is that the employee is not the disabled person, but rather their child is the disabled person and that they may need some sort of accommodation for working um, or going home rather to take care of their child. Um, under the ADA, there are a lot of accommodations that can be made. Work schedule flexibility, um, that's one of the things that can be treated as an accommodation for a disabled employee, let's say. If the employee finds that they are being discriminated against or he or she is being discriminated against based on their child's status as a disabled individual, then that is something that the ADA actually offers protection for. That's good you, to know. You don't, you, uh, what the ADA does is protect individuals who have known associations or relationships with disabled individuals so that they are not punished based on those known associations or relationships. So someone who they themselves are not disabled, but they are a parent, for example, of a disabled child, they would still be afforded those benefits through the ADA. They are not permitted to be discriminated against based on their relationship with their child or their association with their child. So let me ask you this, if that does occur and they feel that they were treated differently in the workplace because of that, is there a potential for a discrimination lawsuit there? Well, I mean, typically you want to have conversations before you have lawsuits. So Potentially though. I mean, you want to talk to your employer, but what if the employer says that, comes out and says it? Well, uh, this project is very timely and I don't believe you have the time because you have to take your child every Tuesday or whatever the case may be. And the employee said, well, if you had just given me a chance, I would have found another accommodation somehow, some way. And they just don't see that they could come to an agreement on that. What can someone do in that case? Is there any kind of recourse? So there, there are a couple of things I think are involved in that question. One of the things has to do with the ways that an employer can treat an employee who he perceives to be disabled or who he or she perceives to be affiliated with someone who's disabled. They will not be able to discriminate against the employee in terms of hiring, promotion, job assignments are one of the things, right? So we, the ADA does not allow for employees to be discriminated against in any of those areas. Project assignments would be included among those things. Um, but again, if the employee actually thinks that they qualify for a accommodation, it would be the employee's obligation to make sure that the employer is aware of any accommodation that he or she might need, including work schedule changes to deal with different things so that perhaps they can take on different assignments or limit uh, their, their uh, commitments in the workplace. What I love is you're an attorney explaining how we can come to agreement instead of jumping to a lawsuit. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Great. A lot of uh, you know the practice that I do is litigation, but the things that you don't hear about the things are the things that don't become litigious because really this is designed to create a, a space. The reasonable accommodation is a space where employers and employees can sort of figure out what works. A lot of times what employers are most concerned with is, oh, cost. And am I going to not have a person be able to fulfill the obligation that I actually you know hire them to fulfill? So those are the concerns that are on the employer's mind and we as you know counselors uh, for largely management side employers we help them to think about what are cost effective efficient ways that it can actually still go ahead and accommodate their employee well you are someone as an employer especially when you're looking to minimize because of course as employers they're always worried about employee retention because it is far more expensive to obtain a new employee than it is to accommodate a current employee that they're otherwise happy with. Thank you very much, Janelle, for coming on the show and educating our audience on how to handle any kind of potential conflict with either yourself or a family member with a disability. Thank you for having me, Vivian. Thank you so much. Our next guest, Ron Yaish, is here to shed some light on helping special needs families keep life simple. Welcome, Ron. So my first question is, can you explain to me how complex 
having a disability for especially a child in a family, what that can do to someone, especially their finances? So it's a good question. Um, the, I would liken it to um, a reality show, of uh, let's say a chef reality show, where you walk in, things are really tense, everybody's on you know, a, a pressure type of environment, things are flying, and there are a lot of expectations. And all of a sudden, you have to take all the ingredients and you have to kind of make something beautiful. So that's what, that's what walking into a life of uh, a family who has a child with special needs is like. You don't know what you're going to get. The families are very unique and very different. The individual with special needs is very different. And the social dynamic of the entire family really shifts and changes depending on how the family handles the situation. Well, so many people talk about a 529. Sure. <clears throat> what is a 529A ABLE account? It's fairly new. Explain that, please. Okay, so before explaining that, you have to understand. One second. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I wasn't going to be able to hold that in. Oh, well. <coughs> Let me start that again. Sorry. There is a new program out there, the 529A ABLE account. It's pretty new. Can you please explain that for us? Sure. But first, I'd like to explain why that may be significant to a family who has a, ch a child with special needs. So in order to get services, in most all the states, an individual with special needs has to have a certain amount of, um, a certain amount of need and uh, be on a certain level of poverty line. So for the most part, under $2,000 in assets in order to get benefits, uh, Social Security, uh, disability benefits, et cetera. So what happens if somebody winds up getting a gift for a Sweet 16 or a graduation or a bar mitzvah? Uh, that money adds up. So where does that money go? So the government came up with this idea of having a 529 account where this individual with special needs can have up to $14,000 a year put in without impacting their services. That's great. Yes. Because I was, I actually have a family member now who was told that in order to get uh, Medicaid assistance, they had to get rid of almost all their assets, similar to the $2,000. So is that possible if someone's on the cusp? Uh, is it possible to do a spend down in order to get that qualifying amount? You definitely can do a spend down. Um, it depends on the family's situation. The ideal is to have a special needs family trust. That's very expensive, and it's not so. It's not easy for a family to come up with three to five thousand dollars to create a trust. So this is another option for families to be able to save to have that, um, so that they could get the services. But there is a little bit of a difference between a special needs trust and the five twenty nine. The special needs trust, after the trust, ex after the individual expires or dies. Um, that, that money can get dispersed to anybody, and the government doesn't go in and, and claw it back. So I have a relative who has someone with a special need, but she's now an adult. But Correct. her parents in their 70s are concerned. So we are talking right now about children, but even though this person is an adult, if so you're talking about a child who is maybe 16, 17, even 20, 21 years old, but they don't, the parents don't see that child being able to care for themselves. Do you recommend that? Because unfortunately, people do pass away together, parents. Right. So what if they're going out together for any reason whatsoever, and they have to leave this child with a caretaker? Do you recommend a special provision in a will as part of being a responsible parent to take care of this child, maybe of a trust? How do they disperse a large or any size of money in a will to this child to make sure they're maintained and taken care of? Okay, so there are really two parts to this. One part, I would say, it's important to have another component besides for the will, something the families don't do often enough. It's called a, a letter of intent. Oh, what is a letter of intent? <laughs> a letter of intent is basically a guide to give the next person who's going to be taking care of your child uh, to be able to fulfill that child's life the way you envision it. As complex as their personal habits, their personal needs, um, you know, Johnny you know, is having a really tough time going to sleep every single night and no one knows why because mom forgot to tell the person 
um, who's caring either in a group home or, what, or whatever environment, that Johnny needs his pink pacifier in his left hand. Otherwise, oh. he won't go to sleep. Or certain you know, hygiene um, care or certain medical care. Um, so the letter of intent is crucial. And then side by side to that, you definitely want to have a will. You definitely want to have a will articulating who the money is going towards. But if you could afford it, ideally, you want to have a special needs family trust. So there is such a thing as a special trust for the special do, yes. needs trust. That yes. I yes. was not aware of this. Yes. And uh, is so my next question is, everyone who has a special needs child is naturally not a wealthy family. It's a cross Correct. section of the public. Correct. Is there ever any kind of place that they can go to provide resources to get help for this? Or do they only have the resource of going to an attorney and that's it? Any suggestions on that? So I would say, Families really should reach out to two groups. One is ARC, any, any not-for-profit in the what local. What is ARC? So ARC is a, a not-for-profit that most communities have that focus on families of children with special needs, providing resources, providing workshops. They're really amazing. And it's also a good opportunity to meet other families in similar type of situation where they can network. Oh, so they can have a support group as well as other types of resources provided for them. Correct, correct. So families find... You know, I find a lot of families are under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, divorce is right. higher in family special needs. So that is an interesting because, of course, we've had specials on our show previously, attorneys and other guests. Right. So let me ask you this. Because you have more of a pressure cooker situation because, of course, a special need child would, I would assume, innately cost more for the family and be more of a financial burden, just the day-to-day -day operations. Do you ever see, as someone who works a lot frequently with this, specializing in this type of family, do you ever see more divorce because of stress or maybe other financial constraints, for example, um, increased domestic violence or perhaps maybe per increased likelihood of losing their home because of that financial pressure put on upon them by the special needs child? Okay, so there is definitely pressure financially, but there's also pressure socially. Um, what I hear a lot is, uh, you know, from the parents and from the siblings. Siblings are a really key uh, part yes. of this. Uh, I lose, I'm losing self, of, I'm losing my sense of self. I'm not there. The sibling is feeling like the entire family is revolving around this child. Where is their place? Why aren't people caring for them? Um, what is going to happen when mom and dad are not around? Am I just expected to take, take care, care of the child? Person. I didn't ask for this. Why am I in this position? So the, the social emotional component I find to be really crucial. Of course, there's a the financial piece. And we're very thankful to organizations like uh, the state and the federal and uh, as well as not-for-profits that really step in and help guide families through that financial component as well as individuals like myself who focus on families with special needs. Fantastic. Now we do have to wrap up, so can you give us just one little quick takeaway on what you'd recommend for parents of disabled children to do? What's something that they could have as a great resource? Okay, so can you tell me real quick, what's last one last parting uh, pearl of wisdom you can provide? Get advice. Get advice. So who are where they look for advice? Is it a CPA situation? Is it a attorney situation? Or do they just trust that you think that ARC is a great place for anyone of any kind of disability? Because I know it originally stood for uh, Association of Retired Retarded Citizens, correct, right? Correct. Originally, but this was a long time ago. So correct. of course they broaden the scope. So do you think anyone could go to ARC and maybe have, uh, they could provide them further information? So I would say ARC is one is, 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 is definitely a backbone in the special needs community. Um, but getting advice, you know, if individuals want help with taxes, they go to a tax attorney, they go to a CPA. If individuals want help medically, they go to a doctor. It's important to seek guidance because you don't have to have this on your plate and that financial pressure can be relieved if you get the right support. Great. Thank you so much, Ron. I appreciate you coming in Thanks. to help our viewing audience.